It's October 23rd, 2003, around 6.30 in the evening. The sun is starting to set over Grand Avenue in downtown Los Angeles. The street is packed with lines of limos and fancy cars. Along the curb are ushers dressed in red coats, helping LA's elites out of their cars. When the people dressed in tuxedos and elegant gowns emerge, they stand in awe of the metallic curves that flow above them. The spotlights moving back and forth reflect brightly off the stainless steel scales of the building. Coming out of one of the cars is a short man about 74 years of age, with a full head of white hair and wireframe glasses. He steps onto the curb and is visibly uncomfortable with the bright lights and the crowds of people around him. He adjusts his sleeves on his suit jacket and tries to loosen up his collar. He wasn't used to wearing a suit with a tie. He always preferred to wear t-shirts. His wife beside him holds his hand as they begin to walk into the crowd. When the man looks up at the metal forms around him, he's not like the others with his eyes wide and his mouth agape with awe. Instead, there's a grimace and a critical eye narrowing on every piece of the building, all the missed opportunities and compromises that had to be done to get the building built. His wife places her free hand on his arm. This is your moment, Frank. Enjoy it. A man in the crowd calls out to him. The white-haired man turns and gives a shy wave. As others in the crowd start to notice him, their faces beam with delight. The man and his wife make their way through the crowd and take the grand stairs up to the entrance of the venue. The cameras from newspaper reporters flash all around him. A reporter shouts a question. How do you think it turned out? It's even more beautiful than I expected, the man answered, adjusting his tie again. He looked up at the towering sail-like forms that enveloped the entrance. Seeing those beautiful forms meaning so elegantly like this made him smile. That part of the building came out perfectly. He turns around and sees the crowd continuing to stream into the building. His building. It wasn't an easy road to get to this moment. In fact, it took 15 years of his life and was one of the most challenging parts of his otherwise illustrious career. Fifteen years of design changes, media scrutiny, triumphs, embarrassments, money troubles, and traversing the various murky levels of bureaucracy. But the struggles will all be worth it for him when the audience sees the lights dim and the glorious sounds of the orchestra begin to flow throughout the hall, officially opening the doors of the Walt Disney Concert Hall to the world and furthering the career of its architect, none other than Frank Gehry. Hi everyone, from All Things Architecture, I'm Steve, and welcome to Starchitects. Here we'll discover the stories behind the most innovative, inspiring, and sometimes notorious architects in history. The architects who rose above the rest to become legends. This season we're exploring Frank Gehry's 15-year struggle to get the Walt Disney Concert Hall built. This is Episode 1, The Competition. It's May 13, 1987, and Walt Disney's widow, Lillian Disney, has just announced her gift of $50 million to the city of Los Angeles to go towards the construction of a new concert hall in honor of her late husband. At this time, L.A.'s Philharmonic was utilizing the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion designed by the noted L.A. architect Welton Beckett since 1964. The Chandler Pavilion was one part of the larger Los Angeles Music Center, with two other theaters, including the Amundsen Theater and the Mark Tapper Forum, both also designed by Beckett. The center's architecture is monumental and grand, similar in style to New York's Lincoln Center. The monumentality of the venues and the plaza that connects everything gave it the designation a cultural acropolis. Beckett designed the Chandler Pavilion with his signature total design approach, designing every detail of the building, from the exterior to the door handles. The grand facade with its stately modernist columns were identical on all sides, with the thinking being that no one side of the pavilion would turn its back on the rest of the city. When it opened, it was heralded as one of the finest music venues in America. 
but 23 years later, the building left a lot to be desired when it came to acoustics and its dated aesthetics. The Philharmonic needed a new home, and Disney's contribution was just what the organization needed to get the ball rolling. With the gift accepted, the next step was to begin searching for an architect. Two committees were established for the Music Center Board, which were separate from the city. The first committee was in charge of the development of the hall, headed by a civic-minded man named Frederick Nicholas. He was a real estate developer who was on the board of both the Music Center and the Museum of Contemporary Art. The second was a subcommittee tasked with setting up the competition to find an architect. The man in charge of the subcommittee was a friend of Frederick's and also the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art, Richard Kishalik. Richard was knowledgeable about finding an architect for important civic buildings in the past. After all, he was the man who hired Japanese architect Arate Osaki to design the Museum of Contemporary Art's new museum a few blocks down the street from the Music Center. The rest of the subcommittee was compiled of members of the Philharmonic and the Museum of Contemporary Art. Interestingly, the subcommittee was not going to actually name the architect, but offer its suggestions and opinions. The ultimate decision was with Frederick's team and the rest of the Music Center board. Later in the summer of 1987, Frederick met with Lillian Disney to discuss the project further. During this first meeting, Lillian laid out her stipulations that came with the gift. First, the new hall had to be acoustically superior to any other hall in the world. Second, the new hall had to be built directly across the street from the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion on a piece of land that was being used as a parking lot along Grand Avenue. Third, the new hall needed to be built within five years. And finally, the Disney family had the final say in the choice of the architect. She said, though, that she would most likely trust the choice that Frederick and Richard would pick. Members of the subcommittee began the exhaustive research of finding a finalist of architects to invite into the competition. They embarked on a series of fact-finding trips all around the world, from New York to Paris to Tokyo and to Berlin. They started with over 80 potential architects, eventually narrowing their list to around 25. Among them were well-known architects of the time, like Renzo Piano and James Sterling. All were highly respected with a number of prominent buildings under their belts, but not all were as well-known as Renzo and James. Of all the names considered that seemed odd was Frank Gehry. He was an architect whose work had both charmed and horrified the architecture tastemakers. He had made a name for himself locally in Los Angeles as an architect more aligned with the artists of the area rather than architects. His use of basic materials like wood, chain link, and corrugated metal to create interesting dynamic shapes was eye-catching, but far from the grand civic-minded gestures that the new Disney Hall would need. Nevertheless, by 1987, Frank had designed his fair share of important public buildings, including the California Aerospace Museum near his alma mater of USC, the La Loya Law School, and a building for UCLA. Saying that Frank's name on the short list of potential architects was a long shot was a bit of an understatement. He was making waves, but was he capable of designing something as large and complex as a concert hall? Time would tell. In late 1987, Lillian Disney and the Architecture Subcommittee interviewed the architects on the short list. They listened as each architect gave their rough ideas on what the concert hall should look like and what they saw the role the building would play within the context of the rest of L.A. The interviews were a watershed moment for them. While many of the more prominent architects waltzed in confidently, if not arrogantly, giving their singular vision for the hall, it was clear to many on the subcommittee that they would be difficult to work with and would insist their vision over the needs of the building. And so architects of great prominence were quietly removed from the list. It was March 1988, and Richard's subcommittee announced the four finalists that would compete for the commission. They were Gottfried Bowman, an award-winning architect whose buildings were abstract forms that stood out in their surroundings. He had also designed a number of theaters, including the Hans Otto Theater in Germany. There was Hans Holland, a postmodernist who played with color, scale, and context to create brash buildings. There was James Sterling, a modernist turned postmodernist. Sterling designed everything from brutalist buildings to highly decorative neoclassical buildings, like Number One Poultry in London. And then there was Frank. Each architect was given $75,000 and a list of requirements. 
They were the basic ones that Lillian had laid out to Richard and Frederick a year earlier, as well as more specific ones, such as the hall needed to accommodate around 2,500 seats. The requirements also mentioned connecting the new hall directly to the music center, as well as the rest of the city, and again, it was stressed the importance that the acoustics be perfect. Given Frank's reputation at the time of being an avant-garde architect, it was no wonder that the reaction towards Frank's inclusion on the list of finalists was swift and negative. Some of the more prominent voices in L.A.'s establishment were not thrilled by it. Even the Disney family's personal attorney was concerned that the scrappy Santa Monica-based architect was not suitable to be associated with the legacy and friendly image of Walt Disney. For Frank, though, the criticism wasn't anything new. His entire career was full of naysayers. It began as far back as the 1970s, when he and his second wife, Berta, purchased and renovated the small Dutch colonial house in a quiet, unassuming neighborhood in Santa Monica. The small pink house was completely transformed over the course of a few years, becoming enveloped in crystalline shapes made of corrugated steel, two-by-fours, and chain-link fencing. When it was completed, his neighbors hated it. They even threatened to sue him. With the criticism, there was also a fair share of praise, so much so that in a few years the praise would drown out the naysayers. Frank's house in Santa Monica would be featured in magazines and would completely transform his career forever. A few months after the announcement and into the design process, the architecture subcommittee convened to see the progress of the architect's early plans. Those on the subcommittee offered their suggestions to the architects. It was a test to see how responsive they would be to the needs and desires of the subcommittee. Through those meetings, they saw Frank break ahead of the others, becoming the frontrunner. This is because he was the only architect that seemed to take their concerns into consideration. Frank had an understanding of the needs of the Philharmonic and the city as a whole. Moreover, Frank's demeanor in the meeting was approachable and friendly. The other architects showed a somewhat disregard for the committee's suggestions, and many of those on the committee found the tone of the other architects to be arrogant. While it seemed that Frank was a shoe in to win, being the frontrunner at this stage of the game didn't automatically mean victory. Frank was still the junior architect of the group, but it was hard to contest that the design he was putting together was something unique and special, a beacon for what was possible in the City of Angels. After months of work, the moment came. It was November 1988, and the four architects descended onto Los Angeles to give their final proposals to the Architecture Subcommittee and the Music Center Board. The day before, Frank's team was rushing to put the finishing touches with the addition of a small cafe to the front plaza of the hall, and to make sure that every little detail was right. Each architect was given their own conference room to set up their models and drawings. Gottfried was first to present. Frank was set to present later in the day. As the committee moved from room to room, beats of sweat started to form on the temple of the committee's foreheads. They were in trouble. They had already seen the first two designs, and each one was coming up short. For instance, Gottfried's design featured an auditorium much larger than what the committee asked for, with several rows of seats that didn't offer that great of views. The design by Hahn was promising, but the postmodern still life of various shapes and forms was chaotic. The interior did feature a theater in the round design with clear story windows at the top of the hall. The only problem was the large scale of the building left little in the way of public space. What was worse was that his design did not make any physical connection to the original music center. James Sterling's design captured the energy of Hollywood with a flashy mixture of cubist shapes. The actual hall itself was located inside a large drum-shaped space, with three levels of balconies arranged similarly as Holland's design. And then there was Frank's design. The members of the committee stood before the large model of the hall. Frank stood behind and adjusted his tie and then his glasses. Okay, Frank, we're ready when you are. Frank cleared his throat and looked down at the model. <clears throat> I feel that this place can be a living room for the city. 
a place where the community can come together and be inspired by the music that will be played there. Uh, we did this by breaking down the facade to make it more humane and approachable. Frank gestured to the model. The plan Frank created was simple in its composition, giving plenty of space for the public realm and a connection to the original music center, even as Frank openly admitted to hating the architecture of the Chandler Pavilion. Frank's Disney Hall in this early stage featured two large forms, the hall itself and a 75-foot-tall glass conservatory that would allow for a beautiful garden that would be accessible to the city. He also created a network of terraces along the exterior that offered different views in all directions. This dynamic building was joined to the Chandler Pavilion via a footbridge. Next to the public conservatory was the hall itself, stacked like a surrealistic wedding cake, with various layers of the auditorium blending into each other, creating a perfectly dynamic building that was both grand and approachable. Though it did not show it in the model, the concert hall itself would be cladded in limestone, a material that was used all over the country for important civic buildings. On the far corner of the property was a small office complex to house the administrative offices of the Philharmonic, a function that the music board desperately wanted. After his presentation, he stepped back from the model and thanked the committee members for their time. Thank you, Frank. They shuffled out of the conference room. As they left, Frank exhaled and wasn't quite sure how the presentation went. The architects emerged from their respective presentations, each more confident in their performance than the other. Frank was probably the only one that had his doubts. He was confident that his project was the best, with its commitment to creating a welcoming building, but he wasn't sure if his presentation would be able to sway the committee from the vast portfolios of the others. Even with Frank's insecurities, for the committee it was pretty clear that there was only one winner. The architecture subcommittee was confident that Frank was the only architect that genuinely cared about the ideas of the committee. But it wasn't up to Richard's team to make up the final call. That responsibility was with Frederick and his committee and the rest of the Music Center board. Richard's team wrote up their thoughts and suggestions and waited with the other architects for the official decision. In the days following the presentation, Frank boarded a plane to Zurich, Switzerland. He was meeting with the members of the Vitra Foundation to work on a project to expand his incredibly notable and first European commission, the Vitra Museum in Germany. Back in L.A., Frederick's committee deliberated, each member giving their opinions. Unlike the subcommittee, the Music Center board was much more conservative-minded when it came to architecture. In fact, one member of the board suggested foregoing the competition altogether and simply build another Chandler Pavilion across the street. It took several meetings over several days to come up with a consensus. Though not unanimous all the time, time after time the name Frank Geary came up. They liked the design. They liked how it was both grand and approachable, radical and surprisingly familiar. It was a far cry from the original fears from the city elites that feared that Frank's radical architecture would be hostile. Over several more meetings, over the next few days, the board had narrowed their decision down between Frank and Hans. No matter what the committee thought of the architects, per the original agreement, the final word was with Lillian Disney. After looking at all the designs, she pointed to Frank's proposal. Being an avid gardener for years, she found Frank's conservatory thoughtful gesture toward the city. Frank's was the only design that really understood L.A. and what it needed. Over in Zurich, Frank received a call from Richard Koschelak. Frank, I need you to be back in Los Angeles by Sunday. The board wants to meet with you one more time before they make their decision. I wonder what they want to talk to me about. I think you're going to win this. The next day, Frank was back on a plane to L.A. When he arrived on the morning of Sunday, December 11th, he drove from LAX to downtown to have his final meeting with the Music Center board. They asked him a few more questions about the design. At the end of the meeting, Frederick looked over to Frank and said, I think we've heard everything we need to hear, Frank. Thanks for coming by. As Frank was making his way to the door, Frederick stopped him. Oh, Frank, do you think you could come over to the Chandler Pavilion tomorrow? Around nine in the morning, in the Founder's Room. Frank shrugged. Sure, I'll be there. Great. We'll see you there. Frederick didn't say anything else. Frank left the afternoon not knowing what tomorrow would bring. The next morning, Frank arrived at the Chandler Pavilion with his wife, Berta. 
He arrived into the founder's room and was surprised to find his model in the center of the room, as well as all the members of the board from the music center and the Philharmonic waiting for him. Several members of the press were also there to capture the moment, the moment when Frank Gehry was officially given the commission to design the Walt Disney Concert Hall. But as he stood there so proudly with his hands on top of the model, grinning from ear to ear, little did Frank know of the long road ahead of him as he tries to navigate the political landscape of L.A.'s cultural and political scene to turn his dream into reality. On the next episode of Star Architects, Frank's abilities as an architect are called into question as political and financial issues plague Disney Hall. All the while, Frank's reputation abroad will soar to new heights. This has been Star Architects, the battle to build Disney Hall, a podcast from all things architecture. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you're listening. For more information on this series and everything else architecture, visit arcbydesign.com. If you'd like to learn more about the creation of Disney Hall, we suggest picking up a copy of Building Art, The Life and Work of Frank Geary by Paul Goldberger. Anyway, thank you for listening. I'm Steve, and I'll see you next time for the next edition of Starkitects.